Um, we are back in the book of John, and you might say, boy, we've been in John forever, and, and we have been in John for a long time, but there is so much good stuff in the book of John that I, we're happy to be in the book of John. We're in chapter 14, where Jesus talks about being the way, the truth, and the life. We're going to pray, and then we'll, we'll open up and pick up where we left off. So let's bow our heads. Good evening, Father. And we thank you for spending the day with us in our various places and uh, travels and works and whatever it is that we have done with you today. And we're just glad now that you've brought us together here and, and that we can sit down at your feet and open up your word and, and learn from you. And as you taught the disciples before going to the cross, we now listen for your word and learn from you before your second coming. And Lord, we just pray that you will touch our hearts in a special way tonight. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. But most importantly, help us to see you in a better light. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so John 14. Uh, just a quick recap. It starts off with the famous verse, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And this is Jesus preparing his disciples for the hardships that they're about to go through. And I say that ironically because Jesus is going to have the harder hardship than any of them. But he's, his mind, his focus is preparing them for that time because he knows they're going to have a very difficult time. And, and as he talks about it, he's explaining that they, he's, he's going somewhere and they can't come with him and he's showing them the Father and, and, and we'll... No, you didn't show us the Father. But if you show us the Father, we'll be happy. We you know, just, just give us a glimpse. Yeah, we can see just him. one little glimpse. You forgot that part. Hmm. And, and Jesus goes in and explains, you know, I've been with you for three and a half years now. You've gotten a good look at me, and therefore you've gotten a good look at the Father. Because we are the same. Uh, in fact, verse 11 says, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. In other words, you've experienced a relationship with me for three and a half years. By now you should know and understand. You should have seen it. But if you didn't, you've seen enough miracles, you've seen enough, uh, enough things, enough evidence that you should get it by now. If, if just spending time with me, with me wasn't enough, the healing of others, the compassion, the love, the care that I have extended to others in your presence should be enough for you to believe. Mm -hmm. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Or what what does me. that mean? What does it mean that Jesus is in the Father? Good question. And I mean, these are only just words. If you don't really, well, they make give them meaning. They're not just words. Because, well, they're Jesus words. <laughs> but Jesus yeah. words are only words. Yeah. If people didn't take them to heart, which most people didn't, by the way. Most didn't. So for them, they were just words. Well, for a lot of people, for this them, is just a book. Unless yeah. they took them into their heart, and unless yeah. they made it part of them. Yeah. I, let me find, what does it mean this, that this is Jesus amazing. is in the Father? I found in Desire of Ages 664, just on that point. Uh, if the disciples believed this vital connection between the Father and the Son... Their faith would not forsake them when they saw Christ's suffering and death to save a perishing world. So you're right. To them, it was just words. But if they would have really believed those words, their faith would have been so vivid and so strong that there's nothing on earth that could have ever shaken That's them true. away. Well, I think of that shaking. You know, again, Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross. I mean, he, he's there mm -hmm. um, that very night. And they've already ex you know, proclaimed within their group that Jesus is the Son of God. He's the Christ. Peter led that. You know, so so I'm, I'm wondering here, based on what you read, I'm wondering here, when Jesus dies on the cross, he knows it's going to hit him hard. But if he's in the Father and the Father is in him, then they should realize 
that's not the end. That's not the end of everything because the Father's still there. And, and because he's in the Father and the Father is still in him, there is a future that they have to look forward to. And yeah. it, it's not the end of their hope. It's not the end of God. It's not the end of their future. It, it's not the end of anything. It's a milestone. It's the beginning. It's really. the beginning. Yeah. yeah. It, it's the beginning but, of the future. I think Jesus didn't just represent the Father. He he presented the Father. And it, and it, it was he revealed the Father's character in his works and in his words. Mm -hmm. And so I think God's truth, the Father's truth, filled his words with meaning, just like when he spoke at creation, there was something, power in the words. And at the same time, the power of God produced his, wor his works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so by his words and his works, uh, Jesus presented the Father, yeah. almost as though he was, he was there. Uh, that's why he said, the words I say to you are not just my own, rather it's the Father living in me who is doing his work. Uh, they were so connected, so one, mm -hmm. that if we can just understand and believe that, there's nothing that could ever separate us, because he wants us to have that same relation with him. That's, that's where this whole thing is going. Mm -hmm. He wants us mm -hmm. to have the same relationship. But I think we need to be careful that Jesus, no, he, he emphasizes so much his oneness with the Father, but he also is very careful to separate himself to where he never said, I am the Father. Right. Because there are groups, uh, holiness, oneness groups, that claim Jesus is the Father. And so when Jesus said, I think he was careful in the very beginning of this book, he said, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, mm -hmm. and the Word was God. Mm -hmm. And yeah. he was making that distinction right there. So this is really huge stuff to meditate on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he never did claim to be the Father. And I, I think there's a challenge for those claiming that they, they were one in that respect because when Jesus died on the cross that presents a problem yeah. why'd you forsake me yeah. yeah why'd you forsake me um, not only that but Jesus dying on the cross that means the father died on the cross as well and there's nothing yeah. in the Bible that says anything about that so yeah. I think that I think there's a little that's challenge true. with that's that true. Um, now that said I, I know that's not where we're going but but the the father in me I like what you said about the, the words that he spoke and the, the signs, the miracles that he did, the works. Um, but I think also, I am in the Father, I think validates everything that he said and done. Yep. You know, not only is the Father in me, but I'm in the Father. Yeah. Yep. You know, and therefore, everything that I've said <laughs> is true. It, it's, it's fact. It's guaranteed. I know you've already covered this, but verse 7 keeps using that word gnosko over and over again, the Greek mm -hmm. word, which means this intimate fellowship, this intimate relationship, just like Jack said, just like Jesus had with the Father. So Jesus wants us to have that relationship with him. Yeah. And that's this knowing, knowing so intimately. And that is literally that gnosko is, is that intimate relationship and that's what jesus wants and that's what the father had jesus showing like you said this two-pronged approach this this not only the words that i speak but you've seen what i do you you've seen it all you know that this is what this is what the father's like and this is what i want you to get to know me. That's where he's headed with this. Exactly. Yeah. Well, well I, he headed there already. You know he keeps heading there. But in verse 7, he says, You, if you really know me, you hmm. will know my Father as well. See that if, if you really, in this word, know, this, this word is, is not just to know about someone, but it's in, to know somebody intimately. In fact, Gary, Gary Venon says so intimately that it produces 
offspring. In other words, that we are producing other people who then know about Jesus. I, so, I was yeah. going to say, you guys were talking about that, and I was going to put it on the back burner because I didn't want to carry this out too far. But since you put it that way... Well, it's right there <laughs> in verse 7. Well, yeah. you know, in, in the King James Version, um, when a man was married to his wife and they had that intimate relationship, mm -hmm. it says that they knew each other. That's right. Uh, paraphrasing. That's it. And, and we have humanized that to the point where we talk about literal offspring. Yeah. And that's true. But the spiritual aspect that, that Jesus is talking about in a godly sense goes beyond what we see as humans, but it is what we see as humans is representative of that relationship. Yeah. They are so close, it produces offspring. Offspring evangelistically. And, yeah. I mean, we, we, we produce sons and more sons and daughters of God because they then also would have an intimate relationship that, with Jesus. Yeah, that's exactly what he says in the next verse. Yeah. He says in verse 12, I tell you, the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. And it's interesting, the word anyone is plural. Mm -hmm. Like we, we use the word you. If I'm saying you told me, that's one thing. But I'm saying I'm glad you are out there watching us. Now it's plural. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, this is plural, anyone, and that means not just the disciples. That means all the way through to the end, mm -hmm. we can do even greater things than, uh, than these because I'm going to the Father. Okay, but i got to stop and ask yeah. the question. And it's a question as pastors, elders, etc. We probably all face this question at one point or another. But how in the world do you do anything greater than Jesus? I mean, he raised Lazarus from the dead. Well, How did he get greater Jesus says with that? the Holy Spirit, you will do even greater things than what I have done. Yeah. He says that with the Holy Spirit, with this but what's, advocate, what's this greater? comforter. What would that greater? look like to be greater? Well, well he, maybe bring they, more people. They were afraid he was abandoning them. Okay. That when he goes away, they're going to be left there alone. And Jesus is trying to prepare them for their mission. That's what this whole thing has been about. And uh, so what he's telling them is that my mission, I was sent here to, for God so loved the world, that he sent his only begotten son, whoever believes in him would not perish, so that he can bring us back to be with him in heaven. He wants to be with us. And now... The disciples, after Pentecost, we can look back, after Pentecost and the Holy Spirit, they baptized way more people and won way more people than Jesus himself did. And that's supposed to go all the way through to the end, and that applies to us too. Okay. So what are we doing today that's going to be greater than what Jesus did? So maybe greater in the context of quantity, not quality. Oh, we can't do the quality of what he did. But in quantity, and, and because he could only be gotta, in one place. I got a hand out there, but, but yeah. real quick, the quantity comes because the body of Christ has multiplied. It is not just one Jesus himself going out and doing it, but now there's multiple people who the Holy Spirit's working through. Yeah, because it's through, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we have Christ in us. Yes. Just like Christ had the Father in Him. We, have, we can have that same relationship. Yeah, and the body of Christ is worldwide. So instead of in one focused area, one town, yeah. it's going yeah. on all over. Walt. Two questions. I'll ask the second one after you answer the first one. What works is Jesus talking about? Okay, what works is Jesus talking about? Good He's question. talking about service to others. Jesus showed that what Jesus showed us in his works, he showed us how he was there to serve others. And that's what works we're talking about, is works in service, in, in helping and serving others. That's yeah. what work Jesus did. Well, his ultimate goal was to bring them into the kingdom of God. Exactly. That's the greatest thing he could do for people.
you don't think he was talking about the miracles, the healings, and the raising from the dead, and all of that? Oh, I think he was. I, I think, think all those things showed his service to others. Yeah, I was going to say, I think he was, but that's not the primary thing. Mm -hmm. The primary, it was, Jesus went out to serve. If it needed a miracle, then he'd performed it. But he went out to have compassion on the people to serve them. My second question is a concern. I'm not seeing too many miracles coming from me in my life or excuse me, but none of you either. Uh, does that mean we're failures as Christians? I see a lot of miracles coming from you. You serve this church almost every Sabbath. You have a ministry that many people in this church would consider a miracle. You do things that some of us can't do. Don't sell your short, yourself short with the Holy Spirit. And God uses us in marvelous ways, ways that we can't even begin to imagine. God uses us in, in certain ways that we don't even know we're being used in. As long as you say, Lord, use me this morning in a way that, that will honor you and draw people closer to you. And I think God rewards all of us with that, that pray that prayer. That's just something that God does with all of us every day. You, you are working miracles that you can't even believe that you're doing. God uses us in marvelous ways. You probably are sharing God's love without even knowing it. I was going to say, the greatest miracle is when you see somebody, when you see it click in their head, something about Jesus, something that they're learning to see him for the first time or to understand something about him in a way that they never understood it before. In my mind, that's the greatest miracles. That's what, that's what healing people and raising the dead was all about, was, was expressing the love of God in a way that people, it would click in their heads. And, and so when we talk about miracles, in, in our culture, I think we see less of healings in the miraculous way uh, certainly less raising of the dead. You know, I don't, I don't see that happening that much, you know, sight to the blind, etc. However, I do believe what Dennis is talking about is God is still working. The Holy Spirit is still doing things. And so the, it, it brings up the question, what makes a miracle? There's a yeah. song, in, yeah, no, John. There's a song that says, I believe in miracles. I've seen a soul set free. Hmm. miraculous the change in one just just to see jesus just to just to see a soul look to jesus and give him hope that's the miracle that i think god wants to see from us every day those are the mere were his miracles we are god's miracles if we choose to be used by him <laughs> sorry thanks john <laughs> Go ahead, John. <clears throat> uh, there is a major miracle in me. I went from compulsive gambler and profane language to Seventh-day Adventist. Mm. Amen. 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 And of Amen. course, we got Dina's miracles. But, but even Dina with the can going through the cancer and everything, and God working a miracle in her life. It's amazing how you talk to anybody and they can tell you how God has worked marvelously in their lives, have, have brought them into areas where they can help bless others, and even with their testimony. And I yeah. believe that that's the miracles God wants to see yeah. in yeah. us right there. Can I read one other thing? It just deals exactly what we're talking about. The, the Savior's promise to his disciples is a promise to his church to the end of time, all who will go to work trusting not in what they themselves can do, but in what God can do through them, will certainly realize the fulfillment of his promise, greater works than these shall you do. Mm -hmm. And uh, just yesterday, was it, I got a phone call from someone, 
Andrea told me about it. She called and said, this lady called and said, the urgent, you really need to call her back. And so I did. Never heard of her before. I still don't even know. She's out there somewhere right now listening because she said she's been listening mm -hmm. to all of our programs. And she went on to explain how God totally changed her life and touched her, her heart through something that I said. I, know. I don't even know who she is, mm -hmm. except the name. I don't know where she is. And just because, and, and this is what I wanted to say to, to Walter, just because we can't put our fingers on stuff that, yeah, God did this miracle for me, and God did that miracle through me, that's why Jesus just hammered in. You have to believe that God is going to do greater things through you mm. than you can ever imagine possible because when we get up there I, I think there are going to be a lot of surprises of people who are going to tell us uh, hey thank you and you're going to go huh what did I do yeah and and it just so happened we'd been talking about you know getting up here retiring and you're not out doing meetings anymore and not doing any accomplishing stuff and then I get this phone call mm -hmm. just when I needed it you know, God ministers to us in that way. So don't ever feel like God isn't using you. Well, He's and, always using you. And I think it's interesting, too, that through the book of John, and maybe this, this is John's insight, Jesus seems to really downplay miracles and really emphasize his belief because of who he is, not because of what he does. Now, he'll accept belief because of what he does, but it's really he really emphasizes... And, and it's right here too. Um, where is it? Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. There's the statement. Or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Yeah. Yeah. If you can't believe because of that, then at least look at the works and believe that. I've got Walter, then Dina, then John. I, uh, I think perhaps the reason we don't see miracles of healing and raising the dead among us today is it's very easy for the devil to camouflage that to, okay you know to pretend that happened yeah or to make somebody sick and then make them well but I, I don't know about you but I've heard stories out of the mission field and not that long ago where people were literally heal, healed from a life-threatening disease or literally raised from the dead mm-hmm it happens. We don't see it here. And I think Dennis is exactly right. The, the, the miracles that, that go on in, in our society, in our world, are typically a bit different from what we see in the New Testament where Jesus did miracle after miracle after miracle. His whole life was doing miracles. But we don't see ours as miracles. Yeah, I think, I think, too, just in line with that, I think our society, too, has really gotten into passing it off as, um, how do I want to word this, something that I did, or a coincidence, or, you know, we write it off, anything but God. It's got to be anything but God intervening and doing something special. You know, you were in the right place at the right time. I mean, it's a cliche now. It, not a miracle. You were just in the right place at the right time. So, I, I mean, society today has really fallen into not giving God the glory and, and accepting circumstance, personal effort, mm -hmm. and, and substituting that for the miracles. So, Dina. Amen and amen and amen to everything that everybody's been saying. It's really been good. Um, I believe that we all, just in the little things we do around the church, those are gifts that God gives us, and if we do them, we're, we're serving and, and doing wonderful things for him, and we see things happen, and, and, and uh, people are touched that we don't even know have been touched, and all of these things I, I agree with. But I also hear what Walter's saying with, we see overseas mm -hmm. these things happening. And uh, just this morning in, in our family worship, we were talking about, you know, oh, 
Why can't we see here in North America the things that are happening in some of the countries overseas? And I think it's because of what you were saying, the, the cynicism, the uh, disbelief that's going on in the world and in the church both. And so we need to, we, I think we just need to long for and pray for those kind of things here also. Because I believe those things, it, it's easy to sit back and start saying, well, uh, we've got different kind of miracles here and, and get satisfied with that. I don't mm. want to do that. I want to constantly be trying and reaching for more, um, that for the Holy Spirit to give us more. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, going along with the problem is that we believe that God can do something. We don't necessarily believe that God will do something. And, and we see that come up in the Bible, you know. Do you believe? I believe you can. Oh, ye of little faith. You know, <laughs> yeah. we have to remember that you know, John 10.10, 10, big on Friday nights, but it's also big in the Bible. Um, uh, just read it. Who's John 10.10? 10? Yeah. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. You know, God's plan for us is not to suffer through the things that we suffer. His plan is for us to have a good life. And, and I think sometimes we forget that. We, you know, our, our morning Bible studies that we're going through um, in, in the alcove over here, through our quarterly, mm -hmm. talk about the crucibles, you know, the, the suffering that we go through. And, and, you know, Peter talks about it, Paul talks about it, John talks about it, you know, and it is something we do suffer. And the Bible promises that we're going to, because if Jesus suffered, we will too. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we just accept that as, well, that's God's plan for my life, that I suffer. Yeah. And, and we forget that God wants us to have a good life, you know, and, it, and he does want those good things to happen It's the for suffering us. that brings us to that abundant life. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, there's a purpose for the suffering. Yeah. It, it's not that, you know, I... I well, I'm not going to get too deep but into it. But you opened the door to the next verse when you said, God yeah. can, but will he? <laughs> well, and that, that's it. Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. Because he says, and whatever you ask in my name, that I might do. No. Will do. There, there's not any doubt there. Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask... A little thing in my name. If you ask a couple things in my name. If you ask anything in my name. Anything. I will. Do. I will do it. And that, now, now, <laughs> now would be the time for Walt's question. question. <laughs> Why aren't we seeing it? You know, hey, Dina. I just looked that up. It's future. Um, I will do it future, mm -hmm. which gives us, uh, gives him playroom on the time. Yeah. Not necessarily right now when you ask, yeah. but I will do it. Okay, so it's on God's timetable, not mine. Yeah. Which really starts digging into that whole faith thing. Yeah. To trust him that in his time, in his way, how he wants to do it according to his plan. And now it's getting harder and harder for me to have that faith that I need because I, as a human, wanted in my time, my way, you know, right away. Um, and that's just, that's how we are as humans. Well, when we ask things in Jesus' name, we're talking about his will, not ours. Amen. Yeah. That's right. And that's where we get in trouble. You mean it's you know, not a magic phrase? If I say in Jesus' name, it automatically comes true? Sorry, buddy. No, man. In <laughs> fact, I, uh, I was fascinated by that. So I did a bunch of digging and got into a lot of weeds. So I don't want to bring the weeds out here. But the basic thing that came out to me of all my digging is uh, the first place to mention that phrase, in the name of is in Deuteronomy 18.7 when he's talking to the Levite priest mm -hmm. and he said, he may minister in the name of 
the Lord his God. And if anyone does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name, I myself will call him into account. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name, anything I have not commanded him to say, he must be put to death. So this in my name thing is not a, you know, do this in Jesus' name. It's, it's, it's a lot more than that. Mm. Uh, it ha and, and Jesus himself said, and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. Mm -hmm. So in my name has to be something that's going to glorify God. Mm. If I could suggest to you, we already know what something God's name is. We already know what that means, and that means according to God's character. God's character is his name. That is what it is. Well, you, you, so, I mean, that means you're going to ask for something that's in character with God. That means you're going to no, always ask for, and, which isn't our problem. That is meaning that we are working in the mind and the will of God. We pray to God. We, are, we have a relationship with God. So it says right here, and I will do whatever you ask according to my Amen. character. Yeah. it's according to God's character that means according to what we know would be what God's will is what God would, is like and we know what the qualities of God are is we know what his character is and so that's what we're asking anything according to God's will in his character. I want to turn that. Let, let me read what I just wrote down here. After all my digging this morning, Dennis just pops it up like he's reading off my tablet here. Uh, <laughs> I wrote down, it must be consistent with God's words or his will, since words are an expression of God's will. Speaking in God's name is tantamount to God speaking through that person. And I think that's, that's what you were saying. Took me a long time to get there. But, so, uh, <laughs> so let me let me put it this way, because d does your version say according to? Is that? I will do whatever you ask in my name. Okay, that's in my name. And so it does say in my name. It's interesting that he says in my name right after him saying, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Yes. And, and I think it's not a coincidence that he's saying in my name. Because to ask according to his will, we have to be in him. You know, this, this is the culmination of what we were talking about before. Yeah. He says, God and me, and then later he brings in humans. He wants us in that same connection, that same relationship. And so I think that's, that's really what he's saying here is, if you're in my character, it's not just according to my character, but you're in my character. That's right. I am in you, you are that's in correct. me, and we are together and working as one. I agree. And, and I think that's when we see, because when we're in Jesus, or when we're in the Father, the same way that he is in the Father, and the Father is in him, when we have that relationship, we know what his will is. We know uh, what his character is. We know totally all correct. this. So, so when we're asking things, we're asking because... Because you're connected. doing it according to the will of God and yeah. his character. That's why in verse 14 you can say, you may ask me for anything in my yeah. name. According People leave out those last yeah. words, by the way. It, they it, just think, oh, I can ask for anything. So I'm going to ask for a new super yacht. You know, well, that, they think it means and, just well, saying the words in yeah, Jesus' name. Exactly. Well, you know, but, yeah, but if, that's if, true. if God gives me a million dollars... I'll buy new robes for the choir. Yeah. That's in, his, in, in Jesus' name. <laughs> well, there's another piece of this puzzle, I think, and it's one I've come to head to head with. If I ask something of God, and, and it looks to me like it ought to be according to his will, you know, then it doesn't happen. What I have to remind myself of each time is, he has more information than I do. Yeah. He knows when's the right time and how to do it. 
mm -hmm. leave it with him. So, so this has all brought up a question. And my question is, how do we know when we're in Jesus' name or in okay. his character, etc.? How do we know that we're in that unison? I think I have the answer. Okay. It's really, this could go, I, I don't know that we're going to resolve it perfectly because I don't know that it is resolvable. But in Romans 8, 26, Paul wrote, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for. Hmm. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words can never express. And he who searches our heart knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. Mm -hmm. So that means that I may be praying for a new Corvette, and by the time that prayer gets to God, the Spirit turns it around into something that... A Ford Pinto. That that Corvette really means to me that I don't even know about. Yeah. I, that's, that's the way I okay. look at this thing. Okay. I think a lot of people, and I was just approached by this a couple of weeks ago, how do you really know that this is the person that's for me? You know, mm. how do I know that this mm -hmm. is really mm -hmm. God's will for me? How do I really know God's will? Mm -mm -mm. And there's books written about this. People struggle with this all the time. How do I really know God's will for my life? You know, how do I really know mm. this is the girl for me or the guy, you know, or whatever, you know? And so I think it all has to do with being in Jesus' name. You have to be in a relationship with God. Love God, this relationship with Jesus, to know God's will is to know God and to know Jesus as your friend and to get to know him through the study of his word and through prayer. As long as you're on that wavelength and you are in prayer, and you are just praying to do God's will, then I have the faith that if you pray according to God's will and you pray together and, you know, with a future spouse or, with, or you and your wife praying about uh, how should we get this or not? These are serious questions people have. Not the Corvette thing, but there are many actual real serious things that people struggle with. And how do they know? And I believe it has to do with as long as you have a relationship with God, as long as you are praying and in prayer and in God, in Jesus, then as you move out in a certain way, God will give you peace of mind if that's his will. And if it is not, you will not feel comfortable about it. And with me and my God and my relationship, that works. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take something here. I'm going to take what you said and what you said and kind of multiply it with what I'm going because... I think you're right. I think you're right. That's what I'm trying to say. I don't think you guys are wrong. I think you're biblical. I think you're on the path. And I especially think that because as people, as faulty humans, we're in a growth process. We're, we're continually growing in Jesus, right? We're, we're continually growing in our relationship with him, our understanding of who he is, etc. But I think Jesus actually answers the question in the next verse. Because he, we read through this, you will do greater works, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. How do we know that we are in his name, in his character, in that relationship? Verse 15. And, and folks, before we read it, I want to pause for just a second. And I, I, I want to <clears throat> ask if we can read this without any legalism. Put the legalism aside and read this for what, it, for what he's saying. If you love me, keep my commandments. 
And I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Jesus is, I think Jesus is expounding on what he was just saying. He, he's answering his own, the, the question that was raised there. If you love me, keep my commandments. And, and as I'm sorry to say, as Seventh-day Adventists, we usually stop right there. You know, you got to keep the commandments or, or yes the and ten. no. We stop with the Ten. We stop with the Ten Commandments. Yeah. But what are the commandments? Even the Ten. What are the Ten Commandments? Really? character of God. The, it's the character of God. It's that whole in me and in you. And, and so I don't think we're keeping the commandments for the sake of avoiding punishment or avoiding judgment or anything like that. The commandments, the law of God is written on our hearts. And we're living as the character of God. We are living it in our lives here. And so Anything you ask, when you're, when, you're in, when you're in that relationship with Jesus, when you're in that relationship with God, you're going to find that you are keeping the commandments. It's not keeping the commandments to earn his love, but you keep his commandments because you love him. Mm -hmm. You live that life. You live as he would because he is living in you. Mm -hmm. And then I will pray the Father and he'll give you another helper. To give you the Holy Spirit, there's the answer to all your prayers. That's where, that's where all these signs and miracles and works come from. And that's what we've been talking about this whole time. And I don't want to take up all the time. But I, want, I really wanted to hit that because as, as we were talking, I looked down and I was like, Jesus actually answered it right there, the question that I just asked. He yes. answered it. That's how you know you're in a relationship with him. Mm -hmm. Look at the character of God. Look at those commandments. You know, and, and I'd say, real briefly... I would say any decision that we're making, marrying somebody, purchasing something, you know, whatever it may be, are we thinking it in the way that God would be thinking about it? Are we, are we looking through his eyes to make that decision? What is, in other words, what is my motivation for a Corvette? And I think that's what you were getting at. You know, when, when you pray and the Holy Spirit's taking it, it may mean something that you didn't mean but that's what God means, and He works that in your life. I got I, Walter's getting a cramp in his arm from holding that mic, so let me get Walt first. As far as knowing God's will and obedience are concerned, and, and I think what you were just saying was right on, but this quote that you're well acquainted with, I think summarizes it more beautifully than anything else that I've seen. All true obedience comes from the heart. Yeah. It was heart work with Christ. And if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. The will, refined and sanctified, will find its highest delight in doing his service. When we know God, as it is our privilege to know Him, our life will be a life of continual obedience. Through an appreciation of the character of Christ, through communion with God, sin will become hateful to us. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I think at that point, that Corvette... That motivation for the sorry you said it. We're going to keep using Corvette. that. That motivation for the Corvette, when I get that, is for the purpose of serving God. It's not for the purpose of having a fast car, a cool car, or anything like that. When I get that Corvette, when I ask it in His name and get it, that's because there's a plan for that Corvette, and it's going to be used for God's will. Yes. And well, yes, I could rationalize it that way. We can, ra the, we can rationalize it. Can't figure out how I'm going to win souls with a Corvette. You'd be surprised. <laughs> I, we'll talk. Okay. We'll talk. All right. Thanks. <laughs> Dina. Um, I, I'm going back. I want to go back to what Dennis was saying. Um, and, and again, I agree with everything that's being said. Um, but talking with people that have a question, you know, how do I know this is right? And for me, and I've been in that position, you know, trying to figure it out, and I've had a no answer a few times. 
it, it's, it's just that, being open to hearing counsel from God, either in your heart, which is kind of what you were talking about if you're not comfortable with it, but also being open to the fact that somebody else might see something you don't and, mm -hmm. and taking the counsel mm -hmm. of those around you um, is a piece of that. Mm -hmm. and, and also, sometimes, recognizing that people may be counseling you something that isn't God's will. It's, it's a matter of being in touch with him mm -hmm. and, and looking for that. And Jack and I have multiple times when we're facing big decisions like that mm -hmm. said, Lord, this is what seems right. Close the door if it isn't. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he'll do that. And, and we've had be, it happen. <laughs> and be willing to accept that door closed. Yeah. Right. That's hard, too. Yeah. 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 There's, yeah. there's another piece to this I think we need to, to bring out. Um, does God ever will for us to do something that we really don't want to do? and would not feel comfortable doing? And, Jesus, uh, and Jesus had to go through the cross. <laughs> yeah. So I can't, I can't use my heart feelings mm -hmm. as the final test. Yeah. I think the final test has to be, at least that's where we came out, you know, in so many places in Psalms and Proverbs, it says God made the waves to go this far and no further. He, he sets boundaries. And within those boundaries, we're free agents. I don't think God cares if I drive a Corvette or a Tesla or a model, whatever. Uh, but sometimes he might. Yeah. And if I make a decision that we have potatoes or tomatoes to eat, I don't think God cares about that. But if I make a decision that puts me out of those bounds, then... I have to be able to be willing to take no. And what Dina said, the way we've resolved that is, Lord, this is what we think you're trying to tell us to do. This is what we want to do. This is what we really feel good about. We'd like to go. And uh, one of the things that, that happened, we had a call to be ministerial director in North, the, what was it? Far East Division. That was a big step up, big job. We wanted to go, bad. But we put it on the altar and said, Lord, uh, if this isn't your will, close the door. And so we got a phone call from the guy that was dialoguing with us. And, and I asked him, I said, we want to go, but can I do meetings? And he said, oh, yeah, we expect you to hold meetings. And I said, well, can I bring my family with me? And he said, well, I don't see how we can work that out. Well, that was my no. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it crushed our hearts. We really wanted to go, but there's no way that I'm going to be away from my family six, seven months right. you know, out of the year. Right. So we have to let God have the final say. And he has ways of opening and closing doors that we may or may not want to open or close. Mm -hmm. But as long as we're willing to accept it, look Jonah, you know, he's a good example, Jesus. So I don't know, that's, that's my... Good. Yeah, yeah. I, I think a John over here too. I think perspective would be the way to sum it up. Perspective. Mm -hmm. you know, are we willing to let God have that lead? Yeah. Are we willing to let God say no to exactly. something? Are we willing to let him say yes to something we don't want? You know? Are we willing to and accept think, a door closing? That, that's a big thing. Or a door right opening there. that or we didn't want to open. open. <laughs> uh, exactly. yeah, it goes both ways. But I, you know, again, I think the, for me, the bottom line is... What's my motivation? Mm -hmm. And if I'm looking at it through the eyes of God and how is this benefiting others? How is this benefiting God? If I'm making my decision that way, it's probably going to fall in His will because that's what His love is. It's others-based. It's for the benefit of others. Yep. John. <clears throat> I want to go back to earlier in the conversation about Jesus' words were just words. Uh, Psalms 22.11. This is Jesus talking to his Father. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. When he wanted, when he wanted, when he wanted 
the disciples' help in the garden. They were sleeping. Mm, that's right. And, and keep in mind, we weren't saying, you knew this, we're never saying that Jesus' words are just words. We're saying that some people yeah. received them that way. Yeah, it's just words. Yes. Not, yeah. not that Jesus' yeah. words are ever that well, way. Well, <laughs> in the same manner, some people say this is just a book. Yeah. It, it, same yeah. thing. Some yeah. people say it's just a book, and therefore it's no benefit to them. But if they read it as it is a word from God to them, then they have immense yeah. benefit to them. Um, I, wanted to, I want to finish this last little part here in this passage, because I say a little part, it's actually a big part, but you know, if, we're, if we're asking anything in his name, he'll do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. In other words, as I am in the Father and the Father is in me, be in me and I will be in you. But then remember, we brought this up last couple times. He's preparing them for when he dies. That's right. And this is a crucial thing for him to say because during that period where he is laying in the grave for three days, the one that they've asked for everything, the one that they count on for everything, you know, how can we ask something? How are you going to do it if you're dead? I'm not leaving you alone. I will not leave you orphans, he says, verse 18. Yeah. You know, I will come to you. In other words, you will have the Holy Spirit. God will still be with you even though I am not. God is still with you. So let me ask then, when did Jesus send the Holy Spirit? Depends on in what capacity that you mean. Was it in Acts when the tongues of fire came? Or was it the day he died? That, and I'm not picking on you, this but I'm associating, I'm associating a question because I've also... I've also heard that the Holy Spirit was not there in the Old Testament. Yeah, it was. That it didn't, but it, it was. The Holy Spirit, he was there. That's true. Um, the, the, the Holy Spirit fell on Jesus well, and we find at his it baptism. He, at baptism, yeah, so, exactly. So we see it in different places. So when was the Holy Spirit there? I believe the Holy Spirit was there the whole time. He came in fullness at the, at the day of Pentecost. That's when we see the full expression of the Holy Spirit manifest. And I wonder if that was... Yes. Yes, the Holy Spirit really manifested it. But I wonder if that's because they were so in one with wanting to spread the word and in prayer and open to it that it couldn't help but being manifested in a powerful, beautiful way. In other words, so I hear people constantly saying, oh, I'm constantly pleading for the Holy Spirit and I'm praying for the outpouring, which we're supposed to do, by the way, I pray for the Holy Spirit. But I just wonder if the Holy Spirit isn't falling around your ears right now and you're just going to be constantly pleading for it even though it's already falling. In other words, should we not? No, that's a negative question. I don't like to ask that. We, I, uh, we should be in tune with God and with the Holy Spirit constantly so that God is pouring out his spirit on us daily, is what I'm saying. But as humans, as people... We have a natural tendency, when it starts to rain, we put an umbrella up. That's true. And we pray for the Holy Spirit to rain down on us, and I think we do. I think we put up our umbrellas because that means yeah, see. that those, those works that we were talking about before should be manifesting from me. And if they're not, that means that I did not receive the Holy Spirit. That's right. And the whole fear thing factor comes in. Next thing you know... I don't even just have my umbrella up. I've put on a rain suit. I've walked inside and shut the door. And I, I think in that way we avoid yeah. the Holy Spirit. I and, agree. Do um, we, if, because if the Holy Spirit fell on us, would we really want it to change our lives? Well, and I think that's it. I think would it's the we fear. really want it? I think it's the fear that... I'm going to pray for somebody and that prayer won't be answered and that will be evidence that I don't have the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. and people will look at me. You know, I, I think you know, just being a human, that's the way our minds tend to work. Is, is we, don't, we would rather walk around in my, my suit in church 
my hair combed, pardon the expression, my hair combed, looking good, carrying my Bible, being able to recite the verses that I want to recite, etc., etc., than to actually open myself up to the risk of the Holy Spirit. That's right. And, and I think a big piece of the answer to that question is uh, what Jesus said when he told the disciples last words before he left them. Uh, he said, in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. So we can pray for the Holy Spirit all we want till we're blue in the face until we're willing to allow the Spirit Amen. to use us to be his witness. That's what it takes. It's not going to happen. And to use us according that's to right. his will, yeah, I, that's not it. mine. Yes, I think of these 700 terrorists who months ago would point a gun at you and then rub you out without even thinking. And now they're going all over the place in the jungles with their Bibles winning people to Jesus. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, the whole, that's what the Holy Spirit does. He Amen. wants to do that through us. Changes your life. Yes. You need to be willing. Willing to be used by God. Yep. Yeah. Not resistant. That's it. Not resistant to being used by God, but willing to submit yourself 100%. Lord, you do with me whatever you want. And that's what works, I think, we're talking about. Yes. That is the works that Jesus really yes. showed. Yes. Those yes. are the works to be used by God. And that's and, where we're headed. I thought we were going to do it this week, but I guess we're going to have to wait till next week. Going to have to wait. Because that's the next where these week. next few verses take us. Yeah, we may live in the desert, but we got an awful lot of cliffs <laughs> that we hang from. Uh, and, and we've done that to you again this week, uh, uh, another cliffhanger. Um, we're going to continue, actually we're going to get a little bit deeper into this uh, concept of being in Christ and Christ in us and the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. We're, we're going to get deeper into that. So I say that to say you do not want to miss because it, it, this is not it. It goes further. And, and I don't say that just in the context of it's interesting. I think this is important for us to know. I, I think it's vital for us to know the Holy Spirit what he's about. I know we're studying Jesus and seeing Jesus through the eyes of John, but I think in order to do that, we have to see the Holy Spirit as well Amen. and experience the Holy Spirit. So I invite you to come back next Wednesday night because we're going to reopen this and continue the discussion further and, and get an even better understanding of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Um, in the meantime, though, I, I mean, I got two minutes and I need to mention that Friday night we got something going on here too. And I believe we're going to have a little music again. Am I correct? Am I on the right week? Got a little more music this week. Uh, many of the people that you see here tonight are going to be here just singing and playing instead of sitting with their Bible open. Um, and then this weekend, oh, um, we're going to talk Saturday morning about shining your light about shining your light into the world. This church has a, a vision statement uh, of what, how's it go? Lighting our world, oh, I say yeah. our world, lighting your world oh, with Jesus' love. Yeah, that's right. And we're going to talk about one way that you can do that this weekend. Just one way. There's many ways, just one. Anyway, let's bow our heads and we'll close with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this Oh, this beautiful study. Um, I can't describe it any other way. It's just so interesting, so neat to see what Jesus is trying to open up to his disciples and in turn us too. And to see the interaction, the, the interrelationships, Lord, it is just, it, it's beautiful to even try to conceive of the relationship between you and the Father and the Holy Spirit and what we can have with a relationship with you. So Father, we just pray tonight that you would touch our hearts, that you would walk with us, that you would not let us go, that you would draw us into that oneness, that relationship where we are in your name, in your character, and then we will see those works manifest. Even when we don't even know what's going on, 
we will see the evidence that the Holy Spirit is there. Lord, we pray for safety for each and a wonderful weekend. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.